Hello, I'm Michael, and I'm going to show you how I use virtual machines to run multiple operating systems. It's a very simple concept, a very basic concept, and the way I go about it is pretty basic. And what it does is it allows me to take multiple operating systems. Let's say I'm running Windows and I want to run Windows 7, Windows 10, and Windows 11 all at the same time in one environment. I want to run them all in the same time on one computer. Virtual Machines is a way to do that. In this case, I'm going to run two editions of Linux, right? So my main environment is Fedora 37. But inside Fedora 37, I'm going to run Debian 11 and Ubuntu 22.10. And the reason I'm doing this is in preparation for developing software where I want to be able to create software that runs successfully in the Debian and Ubuntu environments. But of course, if I build that software in the Fedora environment, Fedora's file formats don't line up with the formats for Debian and Ubuntu. What that means is that if I can get the software to successfully build in Debian and Ubuntu, then that means the software will run successfully in Debian and Ubuntu after I do all of my testing and make sure that everything checks out okay. But the first step is to make sure I have the tools I need to set up the environments and then go through the process of configuring the environments and then testing out the environments to make sure they work the way I expect. So in the segments that follow, we'll go through these processes for setting up multiple operating systems using virtual machines in Fedora. The process of using virtual machines in most cases begins with ISO files, .iso files. .iso files are files you can download that contains an operating system, the installation for an operating system. So when you want to set up an operating system using a file, the .iso is the way to do it. So here, I'm in Virtual Machine Manager in Linux. There's a program called Virtual Machine Manager, and it allows you to create a virtual machine. And the virtual machine starts out linked to an ISO, right? And you have to determine how much memory and how many processor cores you're going to have this machine use. It's using this RAM and it's using these cores off of the main processor and the main RAM that you have. So it's important that you get this configuration right, but you could change it at any time. So I've booted off of the ISO for Ubuntu. And this ISO contains everything that's needed to install Ubuntu successfully. So the menus for choosing the installation for Ubuntu inside the virtual machine is the same as if you were to do it directly on a computer. We see the background image for Ubuntu 22.10. And in this particular case, in this situation, it took several minutes before the Ubuntu environment, the installation environment, was ready. And so the main machine that this is all running on has 32 gigabytes of RAM. So designating 4 gigabytes of RAM to this virtual machine, that's not really an issue. And so it becomes more of an issue if you decide to have multiple virtual machines that all have, let's say, 2, 4, sometimes 8, or 16 gigabytes of RAM, then you'll need more memory in your main environment. So here I'm selecting the ISO for, for Debian. So I'm going to install Debian at the same time that I install Ubuntu. Normally I would install one virtual machine at a time, but 
I've done this enough times over many years that I am confident that doing simultaneous installs works pretty well and there are no conflicts and no issues that I have to worry about. So I give the virtual machine a name, right? So this is the name that you can identify it by in the virtual machine manager software environment. So Debian is, the Debian install is starting up and we still have the window for Ubuntu over on the right hand side. So now I have, I actually have two operating systems running within my main operating system, right? So I'm running from Fedora and inside Fedora I got Debian on the left and Ubuntu on the right. I know virtual machines have been around for a long time. I was using them in the early 2000s, but I still find them to be a pretty cool concept. So I go through the install menus for Debian 11. As we see, Debian has no problems running in a virtual environment. And one can see in this, this moment why Debian is considered one of the, the chief sources of Linux, the chief operating system for for building other Linux environments. Ubuntu comes from Debian. Linux Mint comes from Debian. And I see, every time I run Debian, I see why it is the baseline, it is the root chakra for these other operating systems, for these other Linux-based operating systems. So Debian is the, is the parent. It is the the genesis of these other Linux operating systems. And you see it here. And so Ubuntu did load eventually on the right-hand side. And so I'm toggling back and forth between these windows to make progress. Like I say, there are times where I will install one virtual machine at a time. But in this case, because of the work that I was doing, right because these screenshots that you see this video that you see of this process i didn't intend to actually do a video for this this is actually actual work that i am doing to build a software package later down the line right and so i am in a sense multitasking in this scenario so what i have here is a setup for Debian and I'm also going to set up a couple of other virtual machines but um, those I don't depict in this particular video I'm just setting them up and you'll notice how I browse to the ISO files I browse to the directory where I have the ISO files what I do is I take the ISO files that I've downloaded and I make a duplicate of them I duplicate them all into their own into another folder, right? So let's say I have a folder called ISO where I put all the ISO files in. I'll have another folder called ISO-VM where I will have copies of those ISO files from the ISO folder. And the reason I do this is because Virtual Machine Manager and Kumu, which is the underlying system that runs the virtual machines in this Linux environment, uh, KVM Kumu, they like to change the permissions of the ISO files. And so I don't want my original downloads to have their permissions changed. And so I set aside copies of the ISO files into a directory that can be under the full control of KVM Kumu. That's how I do it. Others may do it a different way. They're all valid. And so this here is my test Fedora environment, right? I'm running in Fedora and the environment that I'm running, the main environment, has software development tools for building software in Fedora. So that's not a problem for my main environment, but when I want to test that software, I want to test it in an environment that doesn't have any of those software development tools. You see, when you build software and you have various tools that you use to build that software, those tools can change the outcome 
of the testing situation. Other computer systems that run that same operating system, other computers that run that same operating system may not have those tools. And because they don't have those tools, they, they may not run the software the same way that it, that it runs in your environment. You may see different results. And so in order to know what the, the, what the outcome of running the software is in a default setup of an operating system, it's best to set aside a virtual machine that is nothing but a blank slate install of the operating system that you're going to target or deploy. So I do the same thing for Ubuntu in this case. So I'm essentially going to have a Debian environment where I build software and do a quick test. And then I'm going to have an Ubuntu environment where I can build software in Ubuntu because even though Ubuntu comes from Debian, there are some slight changes in the Ubuntu environment that could affect the way software that's packaged up in the .deb format, um, how that software could respond when you attempt to install it in an Ubuntu environment. So, it, so the, the big picture is it's important to have these things clearly separated and delineated so that you are uh, able to understand how the same program works in different scenarios, different situations. So I got my twin Ubuntu environments up. On the left-hand side is what's going to be called the standard non-development, non-technical environment for Ubuntu and I go through a normal installation there. On the right hand side I'm doing a minimal installation because I don't need all the extra things that you need in the typical desktop for the development environment. I need just the basics because I'm going to install development tools anyway and I'm not concerned about LibreOffice, Firefox, or any of these other things, even though I will get Firefox, I, that, that's a given, but I don't necessarily need LibreOffice or photo editors or anything like that in the, the development technical uh, case. So I ha will have these two environments separated appropriately to affect that type of testing scenario. And I try to keep the names of these machines distinct, not only in terms of the name of the virtual machines, but the way the, the environments re represent themselves in the network. Because although these virtual machines may not be servers, these are, these are desktops, these are not servers. Even though they're, they're desktops, right? they're still running on a local network. The local network is confined to the, the computer I'm running it on, right? So there, it's not internet facing. It can access the internet, but it's, it doesn't, it's not reachable from the internet in terms of, like if I was running a web server and I configured it with a public IP address and so on and so forth. So as you can see by using virtual machines, you do all the same steps. You go through all the same configurations that you would when installing them directly on the computer's hard drive. And I got Fedora's, the Fedora install running in the background, so uh, that's awesome. The Debian install is running successfully. That's great. And everything is moving along at a pretty good clip and you can do these types of installs many times but it's it's wise to monitor them as they're going along because certain anomalies that you might notice that you that didn't occur all the other times that you did this could be an important factor in terms of if you ran into 
a error or you ran into some kind of weird condition when running software in the environment or running the environment itself. It is important when doing the Debian install in some of these installs that you have an active network connection. You can go around that, but it's more straightforward if you have an active live network connection. That wasn't the case many years ago, but that is the case today. So it's kind of flipped, but that's all right. The development Ubuntu install is almost finished, which is no surprise because I chose a minimal installation with it, so there's less for it to install. There's less, there are fewer files for it to, to copy into the, the virtual hard drive. And so right now we actually have four operating systems running at the same time. We have four. These four operating systems I've been using for the past couple of days, maybe a week, week and a half. I've moved pretty rapidly uh, in this process of using these virtual machines here in January uh, 2023. And so I believe it was January 14th that I spun up a virtual machine to test out a Fedora package. And as you can see here, um, this is a system, system monitor is showing how much memory I'm using right now. And the machine has 32 gigabytes of RAM. The computer originally came with 8 gigabytes of RAM. I upgraded it to 32 because I knew I was going to run multiple virtual machines and I didn't want to have to turn one on and shut one down, and turn one on and shut one down. I needed to be able to run them all at the same time for convenience, for productivity, to save me time and to make the operation of using these virtual machines simultaneously more a more smooth operation. So I'm going through here toggling different options so I can have more visibility on this process of using virtual machines and how they interact with my main system, the main system that they're running on, right? And so it's more of a point of curiosity because the big picture is that if you have enough memory, you have enough RAM, and you configure your virtual machines within a certain uh, range, then you are going to be in good shape. So I allocated four gigabytes per machine, right? So, and I'm running four virtual machines, so that's 16 gigabytes total. So I'm actually safe because I, I have enough room when I have 32 gigabytes of memory. But here's the thing, when we, and not to get too technical on this point, but you got swap files and you got other tricks, techniques, methods used in your operating system. So even if I ran with the original eight gigabytes, I would still be able to run the four virtual machines at the same time, but I would either A, run into some error situations, or B, the, the virtual machines would run more slowly. And I could do various workarounds for that, and I have in the past, but rather than do that, it is simpler and much more straightforward simply to have more RAM. So some of these installs are done. The looks like the two Ubuntu installs are done. So I'm going to go ahead and restart those machines. The way Virtual Machine Manager works in Linux is that once the install is done, you click restart if it's a desktop install, it automatically disassociates the ISO file. And it does the correct configurations uh, in the current version of Virtual Machine Manager so that when you reboot, it now reboots into the installed operating system rather than booting off of the ISO. So that's a nice convenient feature that they've added to make the operations more, more smooth. I know some 
people like to use Oracle VirtualBox. And I would say in the early 2000s when I was using Virt, um, what's that name? VMware. Yes, that's not, a, that's not a name I've used a lot. Wow, I haven't used that name in a long time. But I used to use VMware a, a lot, um, mainly in professional settings. Um, you know, I, I didn't have a personal copy of VMware. That was something that you, you bought and you used it in Windows and you did the same things I'm doing here. But, uh, and VMware does work for Linux, right? But I wasn't interested in using it in, in Linux at that time. So after, after VMware, I then decided to use Oracle VirtualBox because Oracle VirtualBox was GUI based. It was straightforward and I could use it the same way I'm using Virtual Machine Manager here. What I like about Virtual Machine Manager is that it is managed and maintained by the wider Linux community and it aligns more closely and it, it aligns better with the entire Linux philosophy, worldview, perspective, etc. So it just fits Linux more like a hand in glove in my opinion. Although VirtualBox t traditionally had better support for graphics cards and graphics. So if you're into that sort of thing, you might find Oracle VirtualBox to be more useful. But I like KVM Kumu with Virtual Machine Manager. Uh, that's my favorite combination. So here I have the Ubuntu environment up, uh, the development one, and I'm just going to update it, make sure I get all the latest software updates uh, for it. It does automatic updates. I know they all do automatic updates now, um, or at least you can set them up that way. Right, but I still like to do it this way because um, I like to have a little bit more um, direction over the way the updates are applied, when they applied, and etc. See this pop up box here? Um, that's the automatic update system, so I'm kind of competing with it at the start of the system. Usually, what I do, and I don't recommend this for most people, but I remove, I like to remove the GNOME Software Center. Um, I like to remove the software centers, but that's just me, right? I wouldn't do that in every case, but in many of the cases that I I I, uh, I go I operate under, I'm going to remove uh, remove the software centers. And so, so yeah, and here I'm I'm kind of shutting it down. I'm not removing it, but I'm kind of. Um, making it a little more quiet in the future so that I can do this this operation here the way that I like to do it and uh, but still have the benefit of the software center because over time I have realized that the software center or what I like to call the app store or the original app store because I do think that and I could be wrong. I, I didn't research this heavily, but I do think that, like, uh, what is that, that program called? Synaptic? Is it Synaptic? I think Synaptic or some program like that predated the app stores the, or the concept of the app store by maybe five to ten years. So I believe app stores came from Linux first, but that's just my point of view. And so... Anyway, I see an advantage of having app stores and or having app stores in Linux because they they are a very convenient way for for those that don't want to use the command line, such as someone that is um, just using it to browse the web and edit documents and keep up with their files. Very basic use. Um, they don't have to use the command line. They have graphical ways of just clicking a button to get what they want done. But it's also useful for those that are um, more technically um, versed in using the command lines because it allows you to test your software packages with a app store to see if those that are not going to use the command line can successfully install your package without the command line. So that would be a first order benefit of using an app store, right? The second benefit is, as I had demonstrated earlier, where you can just, with a real 
quick click of a few options, you can configure repositories and other aspects of, um, of the Linux environment. So here's the GNOME um, menu. I'm clicking on the activities and seeing what, um, seeing what the, uh, the, the different icons look like. I've removed some icons. And um, my, my plan here is to update each environment starting out so that I, I know that each environment is up to date um, at least as much as possible before I start using them. So I think I have an issue here with um, the test Ubuntu. So I had to force that off before um, engaging that again. But, um, but that's okay. So, you know, sometimes that does happen, and I'm glad there is a way to um, take control of the virtual machine if it reaches a state that is uh, unruly. But in the past uh, couple of days that I've been using this particular um, virtual machine in, in this install here, uh, the, the test on the left side, that left side, that was the only time that it gave me any issues. So um, I was pleased with that. So I got um, the right-hand side. That's the development Ubuntu. That one is um, that one's going along uh, pretty smoothly. And I got, um, I got everything on the left-hand side moving along uh, now. So that's good. And so we're halfway there, which uh, gives me a, a lot of uh, a, a lot of hope for for this process overall. As I've done in the development Ubuntu environment, and as well as the Debian environments, I'm also updating the test Ubuntu environment. So I know as I go through these different terms, right? development, test, it can seem a bit confusing to keep up with all the different ones. So basically there are four environments. Two of them are for development and two of them are for testing, right? And so that's pretty much it. And I am updating these environments, setting them up, and getting them to where they need to be. So once you have this in, in place, right, you can do anything you want in these environments, such as reconfigure them, rearrange icons, whatever need, whatever you need to, whatever you need to do. Uh, this is an, a Fedora environment, so I'm running Fedora inside of Fedora, which is which is pretty cool. And here I've loaded the software environment, the software store, you might call it, GNOME software inside Fedora. Over on the test Ubuntu side, the updates are almost done, so that's that's good. And I'm also going to do the updates for the Fedora environment using the command line, the same as I did for the other two environments. It's a very similar process. sudo dnf upgrade inside of Fedora and sudo apt update and then sudo apt upgrade in Debian and Ubuntu. And in Debian and Ubuntu there are other ways to do that. There are many articles about the pros and cons to each. My understanding is that it's safest and it's most prudent to do the update first, to update the repositories, to update the local database with what the, the latest updates are in the Debian and Ubuntu environments and then do an upgrade. That's the safest way to go about that. And of course if you're using the the software stores, right, the, the GNOME software or the App Store in Ubuntu, then you don't have to worry about any of that because it's going to take the the most appropriate path at least we'd hope, the most appropriate path to performing those updates. And I've shut down a couple of these environments and you'll see that my my memory usage has declined uh, accordingly. So, um, so that's good. But uh, let's uh, dive into this a little bit more and see what we are see what we are accomplishing. So 
here I am, uh, I am attempting to update the software in Fedora in the um, what they would call the guest Fedora environment as well as the guest um, Ubuntu environment and I'm going about that pretty successfully in Ubuntu but um, I had a little bit of a, a delay there in Fedora but now it's catching up and everything is looking good so the Ubuntu environments are all updated as well as the Debian environments and now just uh, waiting to conclude the updates on the uh, Fedora side here the the test Fedora side and you'll see that virtual machine manager gives you a chart of the various resource uh, the resource areas that that are being used and how they're being used so that's that's pretty pretty nice if you don't mind, let's skip ahead and move past the download process because you know that's you know how networks are. Sometimes there are delays, and you know this is where we are when the downloads have occurred for software update in Fedora in the command line using DNF, and so um, it gives us the opportunity to see a listing of what it's going to. Uh, install should we continue forward if I choose yes and press enter the installation of the software packages that are listed continues ahead I actually like the listing of DNF better than I like the listing in apt in Ubuntu and Debian I think the way uh, Fedora and Red Hat and OpenSUSE um, does does things in, in this area um, to me it's better in terms of how the software is presented, um, what options are presented, and um, I generally think that DNF, um, you can steer the install of software much better than you can in apt, in my opinion. Once all the software is installed, what I'd like to do is wrap up with installing OpenSSH Server. What that would allow us to do is access these virtual machines from the main environment, right? That access from the main environment to the virtual machines in terms of moving files back and forth between the two does not happen automatically. And so OpenSSH allows us to do that. Of course, in this case, installing OpenSSH server isn't, um, you know, the, the final step. It's only the first step you have to do other configuration steps in order to make that work successfully. But I show that in another video. I now wrap up this process by shutting down the virtual machines, make some quick edits to the software center, right? And then we're going to just simply shut down the host environment because we are done for the evening. Thank you for tuning in. And if you have any questions, comments, or likes you'd like to send this way, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you.